I remember one of my buddies told me that I had to watch this one particular episode of the show Paranormal Witness. It's a show on Sci-Fi Network. They take people who have first-hand encounters with something paranormal and they make it into a TV show. And I was directed to watch one episode in their first season called The Poltergeist. And when I tuned in to watch it, I, I was ready to turn it off. It just sounded like every other haunting that's ever happened. Family moves into house. They think it's great. Suddenly they hear banging on the walls and all of a sudden demons are attacking them. This story starts the same way. However, they took a whole bunch of pictures and they have a whole bunch of videos. And even if all of it is a hoax, it's terrifying. I remember watching it and, and having to pause it. I was shook up. I didn't want to finish the episode. I thought I would pay homage to, in my opinion, one of, if not the single scariest episode of Paranormal Witness or any paranormal show I've ever seen, and I would retell that story on my channel. And so that's what I'm gonna do today. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all I do and I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, I would encourage you to sneak into the bathroom the next time the like button is taking a shower and steal their towel and their clothes and then run away. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. In 2006, Susan Lewis and her daughter Jamie moved into a new home in Southern California. It was this nice little house that they referred to as their sanctuary. They loved it there. And shortly after moving in, Susan's new boyfriend, Matt, he moved in as well. Matt and Jamie got along great. Also, Matt had a daughter named Marie, who was the same age as Jamie. And so those two got along great. Susan and Matt are getting along great. One happy family living in this beautiful little home that they call their sanctuary. I mean, it's a charmed life. Life. Everything would change when the peanut butter spilled. A few weeks after moving in, it's this beautiful summer day and Matt and Jamie and Marie are all outside goofing around in the pool and Susan steps away from them to go into the house to make lunch for the group. Susan goes into the kitchen and she sees on the counter that a peanut butter jar had its lid off and had been turned on its side. And oddly enough, the peanut butter seemed to be running out of the jar like it had been melted. It was like in a liquid state pouring out of the jar and had gone all over the ground. She felt the temperature in the air and it wasn't very hot. So she figures one of the kids must have come in here and for whatever reason, microwaved the peanut butter and then dumped it on the counter. And so she reflexively turns around. She's like, Jamie, her daughter, Jamie, get in here. Jamie comes inside and she's like, what mom? And she's like, did you do this? And Jamie would say that she literally laughed at her mom. Like, why would I do that? And her mom's like, well, I don't know. Did, do you know if Marie did this? And she's like, no, we've been outside. So she shoos her daughter away and she calls in Marie. And Marie too is like, no, I, I didn't touch the peanut butter. Susan ultimately just kind of says, okay, the kids don't want to own up to it. It's a great day today. I'm not gonna let this ruin it. And so she's kind of rationalizing what's going on. She's thinking, okay, one of the kids must have knocked it over without meaning to, and maybe it was warmer in here and I just didn't realize it and it melted. Any number of things could have been the reason for this, but I just don't care. After cleaning up the peanut butter, Susan leaves the house and they, all four of them, spend the rest of the day goofing around outside near the pool. When they come back in the house later that day, they find that there have been cans that you would keep in your pantry, like canned food, stacked on each of the steps leading upstairs. They also find that there have been random objects placed all over the house in strange patterns. In the bathroom, they find shampoo bottles stacked on top of one another, hairbrushes arranged in a star pattern on the counter. They open the microwave and find peanut butter jars and other random canned foods and stuffed animals from the kids' rooms in the microwave. The cleaning materials underneath the sink had been pulled out and arranged in a height line from shortest to tallest on the kitchen floor. Also, there were just strange liquids all over the walls. It looked like maybe ketchup or other sauces. They couldn't really tell what it was, but it was sprayed all over the house. There was shampoo on the walls and soap on the walls. And so when Susan and Matt and the girls go inside, they think that someone's invaded their house. So they run back out again. They're kind of looking around the property, wondering what they should do and no one's come near their property and they would have seen someone come to their property. So they start filming it. They go in and they film what's going on. That's why we have all these pictures and they have no idea what to make of this. Matt believes it's Jamie, so not his biological daughter. Susan believes 
it's his daughter, Marie, and it starts this awful conflict between Matt and Susan. This would be the start of what would turn out to be a major fracture in this family, because it just continued to grow. You gotta put yourself in their position. If you're Matt or Susan, you don't want this to be anything other than one of the kids did this. If it's not one of the kids, it means you had an intruder in your home. If it's not an intruder, then what caused it? They believe that the other child is doing this. They believed it so much that they did not see reason, but more than that, it would keep Matt and Susan from handling this the way I think anyone should have, which is get the police involved. They don't. So they start cleaning it up and the house was really a mess. So it took quite a while to clean it up. And they ultimately just kind of moved on in that way that people who are in denial move on because you're in denial. That's what they were doing. So a week passes since finding their house in disarray with cans and jars all over the place and liquids on the walls. And Jamie and Marie are spending some time together in Jamie's room. Marie was sitting at a desk that was next to the bed and Jamie had a cup of coffee. She puts the cup of coffee down on the desk next to Marie and says, I have to go use the bathroom. She turns around, she walks out, she comes back and Marie has her head down in her homework. She's not apparently paying attention to anything around her. And Jamie walks in and sees that the cup of coffee that had been sitting on the desk has now been thrown all over her bed. And there's only been one person inside of the room and that's been Marie. She's like, Marie, what are you doing? Why'd you throw my coffee all over the bed? And Marie pokes her head up and she's like, what are you talking about? And she looks over at the coffee and she's just as surprised as Jamie is. She's like, I didn't do that. Jamie doesn't believe Marie. She's mad at her because Jamie believed that Marie was the one responsible for placing the cans and everything all over the house. And so this was just another example of her trying to get attention or something like that. Jamie leaves the room to get some bleach. She comes back and she puts the bleach down on her dresser. She had all her drawers open with her clothes out. And she has this bottle of bleach sitting right at the top of this dresser. And so she goes over to the bed, picks up the cup itself that had the coffee. She puts that back on the table, turns around to get the bleach and the cap has been turned off and it's now dumping bleach all over her clothes. It's just pouring out. Marie had been sitting in the chair the whole time and Jamie had seen her the whole time. And so when she sees the bleach dumping all over her clothes, she knows it could not have been Marie. So she screams, Marie looks over, she sees what's going on, she screams. Susan hears this and comes charging in the room and she's like, what's going on? The girls can't describe what's going on. And as they're standing there, a picture frame falls off the wall and it startles them all. They're looking over and then another picture falls. It's one thing to have one picture fall, but to have two fall in close succession to one another, that's, that's not a coincidence. Susan sees the pictures fall. She hears her kids in hysterics and they run out of there. They get in the car and actually just leave the house because the girls just did not want to be there. This was a big moment in this story because to this point, Jamie, without saying anything, believed Marie was responsible for placing everything around the house and making a mess in the house. Marie felt the same way about Jamie. Again, they didn't say it to each other, but it's how they rationalized it. Susan was doing the same thing, but for both of the kids. She basically believed that either Marie or Jamie had placed the cans all over the house. Now, Susan is starting to believe that something else is going on in the house. And Marie and Jamie absolutely believe something is going on in the house. They actually suggested that we believe our house is haunted. At some point after driving around, Susan and Jamie and Marie go back to the house. Matt has been at work the whole time, so he's not there. When they get back to the house, the house is once again covered in cans all up the stairs, placed in weird orientations on the ground, things in the microwave. The fridge has been opened, all the food's been dumped out. There's liquids all over the wall and they hadn't been there and neither had Matt. Now combine it with the fact that you just had this coffee and bleach incident and the picture's fallen off the wall. They're talking about the house being haunted. You can imagine what it was like to walk into that house and see it like that all over again when it could not have been. Jamie or Marie or Susan. When Matt came home that night, he was just more convinced that it had to have been Marie or Jamie or even Susan because Susan's acting like something's going on here, something paranormal's going on here and he's he wasn't there. He, he didn't see the coffee and bleach incident. He didn't see the pictures falling off the wall. And now he sees his girlfriend kind of buying into this idea that it's some paranormal thing. He was a really intense skeptic and was just absolutely unwilling to see this as anything other than a bad prank that now his girlfriend is even getting in on. It causes a huge fight between him and Susan. He's like, why are you letting the kids doing this? Why are you feeding into this? She's saying, you don't get it. 
there's something wrong with this house. Practically at each other's throats, they pick the house up again. It takes forever. They put everything back. And by the end of it, it's like no one wants to talk to each other. The kids are fighting with each other. Susan and Matt practically hate each other. And that's how that night wraps up. That night, all the power went out in the house. And all they heard all night was doors banging nonstop. And their stove is set to light. So all you hear is that clicking sound. They couldn't get it to turn off. I mean, right in front of them, there's all this paranormal activity and they're recording it. And they have no idea what to do. Even though we view this story and say, come on guys. Either this is an elaborate hoax or you gotta go to the police. You gotta do something right here. You're doing it wrong. You're in denial, you're fighting with each other. You can't do that. You gotta do something about this. But now put yourself in their position. Their world has been completely turned upside down. Everything they believed and understood about the world is being questioned right now. They are trying to hold on to every last shred of that former life and understanding of life that they had before this haunting began. And so they don't handle this well. They just continue to fight and to be at each other's throats, blaming each other for all the things that are blatantly happening in front of them that have nothing to do with Matt, Susan, Jamie, or Marie. So at this point, Susan and Matt and the girls have not told any of their friends or other family members about what's going on. So the next day, Susan would actually go to her close friend and say, Here's what's going on and I have no idea what to do. And her friend would say, maybe you ought to try giving it a peace offering. Maybe this thing in your house, you know, feels like you're intruding. And if you offer some sort of peace offering to demonstrate that you mean no harm, that you wanna coexist, that maybe it'll it'll get along with you. Maybe it'll Maybe it'll stop. So whether this was good advice or not, we don't know. But Susan finally has something that she has control over. And she really gets into this. She gets the girls, she knows Matt's gonna be out for the day at work, and she knows Matt would not be cool with doing this. He would not believe that offering a, a peace offering is gonna do any good. It would just cause more fights. And so she saw this window of time to take the girls and do this peace offering. She had this little figurine, it was a, a cat figurine. Susan loved cats, and she figured that a cat represented something she loved, and so it would be the perfect kind of deliberate intentional offering showing that she means no harm, they mean no harm, let's kind of call a truce here. And she puts candles on this table and she puts the cat right in the middle and she doesn't know what to say or how to do it. And the girls are just sitting there like, what's happening here? And Susan just kind of says, please accept this gift. Uh, it's my gift to you, we mean no harm and we want to coexist. And it just so happens that as they're performing this kind of ritual, Matt came home. He had not slept the night before. It had been a really bad night with the slamming of doors and all that craziness. And so he left work early. He called in sick basically. And he comes into the house and literally sees Susan doing this kind of ritual with his daughter and his stepdaughter. And he immediately goes to like, absolutely not. We're not gonna go to trying to interact with this thing. We're not gonna act like it's real, it's not real. And so he goes over and he kind of picks up on what they're doing, that this cat figurine is at the center of attention. And, you know, Susan and the girls are telling him, don't do anything, don't touch it. And he takes the figurine and he walks out to the back deck and he throws it onto their backyard. And Susan and the girls are crying because they're like, oh my gosh, you're gonna make this so much worse. Everybody's attention is towards the backyard. When they all turn around to look at the mantle, Matt thinking he had solved the problem, there is a figurine, an identical one of the cat that's sitting on the table again. They all gasp, they can't believe it and it doesn't make any sense. They watched Matt throw the figurine. Matt doesn't care, picks it up and throws it on the ground and smashes it right then and there. And it's just this crazy sequence of events that when you hear the firsthand interviews with Susan, she can barely describe this moment because you're seeing something reappear and then Matt is destroying it. It's like a very deliberate, aggressive act towards this thing in the house, the very opposite of what it was meant to do. And Susan would say that she knew they were gonna go through hell for that. That night after everybody finally fell asleep, Jamie wakes up in the middle of the night and goes down into the kitchen to get a snack. When she goes in there, she sees written all over the walls, everywhere is the word cat, everywhere. And she immediately runs upstairs, she gets her mom, she gets Matt and Marie, everybody sees that there's this word cat written everywhere. Matt looks at Jamie and says, you're the one that found this, you did this. 
Susan comes to defend Jamie and says, you're the one, Matt, that smashed the cat figurine. There's no wonder this is happening. And so this horrible fight happens where they aren't seeing what's actually going on. They're just seeing red and fighting with each other. Meanwhile, they're blatantly being haunted. In addition to cat being written everywhere, the house had been completely ransacked. I mean, everything's been dumped out of drawers. Everywhere that you could make a mess, there had been a mess made. And no one woke up to it. They were all in bed. No one woke up to this much of a mess. It didn't make any sense. They start cleaning up this horrible mess. And as they move some things aside in the kitchen, they find what looks to be a huge footprint. It is not Matt's footprint. It's certainly not one of the girls' footprints. It's easy for us to say, well, why didn't you go to the police? But you gotta remember that when you're in real crisis mode, your brain will tell you that everything is fine. It will be in complete denial of things that are right in front of you because it's just, it's a coping mechanism. And so they did nothing and just let it continue. Susan desperately wanted to leave the house, but she couldn't do it financially. They couldn't leave the house. They couldn't afford to, so they're trapped. At this point, the kids are getting very withdrawn they don't want to be in the house, so Marie would end up staying in her room all day. Jamie would do the same thing. Matt and Susan weren't talking. There was just nothing being done to correct the situation, and everybody was so upset and angry with each other. It was just a worst-case scenario. So in the last couple of weeks that they ever stayed at this house, because they would leave, two major events occurred. The first one happened when Marie was home alone. She was only going to be there for a couple hours by herself, and even though Susan and Matt did not want to leave her alone, they didn't have another choice and, and Jamie wasn't there. So Marie's going to be home alone and it's nighttime. So this is like straight out of a horror movie. She's sitting in the living room watching TV and at some point the TV starts turning off and on. So off on, off on, off on. And she knows because she's been in this house now and seen the craziness that something bad's about to happen. And the TV finally just turns off. She can't get it on. She reaches for the remote. The remote flies off the table. And now she's just sitting there frozen because she knows that something's in the house with her. She watches as the rocking chair right in front of her just starts to rock back and forth as if the person or thing that had pulled away the remote had walked over and sat down in the rocking chair and was now looking at her rocking back and forth. Marie is looking at the rocking chair as all the pictures on the walls just start one by one falling off the wall. Marie and Jamie had a habit of always having a digital camera with them at all times because they were taking pictures and filming everything strange happening in their house. And so as she's laying there, just absolutely horrified, she takes her camera in her hand and kind of turns it and just starts taking pictures of the room before running out of the room to get her phone where she calls Susan, she calls her dad, she calls everybody, she's screaming into the phone, you gotta get here, something's going on. And Susan flies home, Jamie flies home, they rush inside and they grab her and she's unhurt, but the house has once again been tossed. And then after it all kind of settles down, Marie says, I took pictures. And so Susan and Matt and Jamie look at these pictures. There are these weird orbs of light that are very clearly in the room with her that are moving around the room. She managed to get a couple pictures of them and they're just totally out of this world. At this point, Matt is convinced that there's something paranormal happening in the house. He's not even putting up the charade that this is Jamie, because it wasn't. It wasn't his daughter, it wasn't anybody. How can you explain these pictures? You can't. And so Matt decides, well, I don't know who we call for this, but I think you call, you call the church. And so he tried calling a bunch of priests and pastors and tried to get anybody to come over. And the best he could do was get a pastor to come over and pray with them before leaving and saying, we can't help you. And so they were totally on their own and they can't afford to leave. They know something horrible is happening here and they're just trapped. And finally, the second major event that occurred in those final two weeks happened to Jamie when she was home alone. Jamie was in her room and she starts hearing pounding on her door. She started filming this pounding on her door. There's no one home with her. And you just hear in her voice that she's terrified and someone is pounding over and over on the door, on her bedroom door. And at some point she knows she has to go into the hall. And so she goes over to the door. She's building the strength to reach down and open the door. And as soon as her hand would go near the doorknob, the pounding on the other side of the door would stop. Like it knew she was about to come out into the hall. And so she didn't open the door and she went back onto her bed and she just sat there in the fetal position for three hours, listening to something smashing nonstop into the door. At some point, the banging stops. And after a few minutes of the banging being done, she thinks this is her chance to escape the house. 
She opens the door and there's no one there. But the door on the outside where the knocking had been happening, there's this huge dent and divot in the door. And the door handle on the outside from the hallway side has been bent downward. On the ground in the hall is a pile of utensils, pots, pans, silverware, knives. Some, this thing had been using tools to try to open the door. Next door to her room was a bathroom and the bathroom door did not have a doorknob on it. You basically just pushed it shut but there was a space for a doorknob that you could actually look through. They just hadn't put it on there yet. And she noticed in the bathroom that the light was flickering. And she thought, I think it's in there. And she decides she's gonna try to trap this thing. So she goes to her desk where she had some string. She goes back over and loops the string through this hole in the door and leans back and pulls the door shut, thinking she's trapped this thing inside. As soon as she does, she starts feeling resistance on the door. Someone is pulling back. And at some point, the string gets cut and she falls back into her room. At which point, the bathroom door swings open and she says, I'm about to come face to face with something out of my nightmares. But before she could see this thing come out of the bathroom, her bedroom door slams shut and she hears the rustling of pans and tools and metal clinking against each other right outside her door. She knows this thing is interacting with all those tools and pots and pans right on the other side of her door. It's this horrifying thought. And after just a moment or two, she sees smoke coming into her bedroom. And so she immediately runs to the door to try to open it. And when she does, she sees that now there is a frying pan sitting in the hall that has a toilet paper roll completely on fire. And that there's been toilet paper strewn all over the hallway. Like this is a wick and it's gonna light the hallway on fire. She grabs a sweatshirt and she smothers the fire. At this point, she's in full survival mode. She knows she has to get out of this house. It's trying to kill her. And so she walks down this hall, pulling aside all of the toilet paper, getting ready to come face to face with this horrible thing. She goes into the living room. The whole thing has been covered in toilet paper, paper towels, papers have been strewn everywhere. This thing was trying to light the house on fire with her trapped inside. And so she manages to make her way through this maze of toilet paper she sees there's no other fire set and she goes outside defeated and just sits on the front steps of her house waiting for her mom to come back. Susan, Matt and Marie were all together. So they came back and they saw Jamie sitting on the front steps, just crying. They go inside, they see the scene. Jamie explains what happens and that was it. They knew they were gonna have to go bankrupt to leave the house. They did not have the money to leave, but they had to leave. And so they barely packed up and they left that house. It didn't sell. Susan literally went bankrupt. And soon after they left the neighborhood, their neighbors left the neighborhood and five other neighbors in their immediate vicinity all left. All of the houses did not sell. They are all vacant. No one knows why. Susan, Jamie, Matt, and Marie, since leaving that neighborhood, even though they were ruined financially, they were very happy to get out of there. They've had no other paranormal activity since they left and they're just glad they got out of there with their lives. So I'd love to get your reaction to this story. What'd you think of it? What do you think happened? Let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to get back to as many of you as I possibly can. If you enjoyed today's story and you wanna hear more stories like it, then if you haven't done this already, please sneak into the bathroom the next time the like button is taking a shower and steal their towel and their clothes. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. If you have a story that you think would be a good fit for this channel, whether it's your personal story or just a story suggestion, please go to our subreddit. It's just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked below in the description and submit it there. I read that subreddit every single day. So I will definitely see it if you put it on there. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram. My username is johnballin416. I also just started using a Twitter account. My username is also johnballin416. And I'm very active on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. So whether I see you on Reddit, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, some combination, I just really appreciate your support. And until next time, guys, that's gonna do it. See ya.